You want to start this one? I don't think they can suffer another hey everybody joke. Okay. <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It feels it feels forced and terrible. <laughs> and and I I feel bad that I subjected our listeners to me stooping so low as to say hey everybody. So I apologize, listeners. I take back my hey. I will not greet you. I'm just pretend none of none of the 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 preceding seconds happened and i'm just diving right in we're just we're talking about the show because you're tuning into the what cast and and that's what you want to listen to you don't want to you can't you can't respond to my greeting so by me saying hey everybody that's kind of presumptuous because what if you want to follow up with with hey mike but no because i'm already talking over you like a fucking asshole so you know this is this is the podcast. This is the Whatcast. If you're a new listener, uh, our show typically doesn't start like this, so I'm sorry. Just I promise it'll get better. Maybe, <laughs> probably just keep listening. Ignore ignore our everything else, and just you, you know if you've got a, if you're listening on a device, just fast forward till you hear some music. That's our intro music for for you new new listeners, and then the actual show starts after it. This is just the intro that comes before the theme music. But sometimes it comes after the theme. Just you know, just just listen to the show and and enjoy it. Yeah, you're you're gonna want to listen to the intro to to know about who who came on. Yeah, yeah. So the reason we're doing this intro before the theme music rather than Yay. and it's 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 been a long while since we've had a guest, and uh, you know it's it's fun to have a guest every now and again. So we had. Karen, also known as her witchy arts uh, on Twitter and Instagram, uh, we had her come on to talk about some of her experiences with uh, non-physical entities and ghosts and fairies and all manner of spooky things and a lot of uh, a lot of sidetrack conversations because. Again, if you're a new listener, that's what we do on the Whatcast. We, we we will have a subject, but probably only half the show will be based on said subject, and the other half will be spent talking about tacos and helicopters and dinosaurs and comic books and your mom. <laughs> so that's that's kind of what we do here. But anyway, you should go follow Karen on all of the things that she's on i think she said twitter and instagram her witchy arts no spaces all together with a little at symbol at the front because that's what the kids do these days and people that use the things that i just mentioned do that too so anyway this is the show and i've completely uh massacred this intro and may God have mercy on my soul. Yeah, I, I bet you they're begging for a good old classic. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Whatcast. Instead, they got a, a whole stream of word diarrhea. So, you're welcome. I'm Karen. I'm an ex- paranormal experiencer. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter, both at, at her witchy arts. And uh, yeah, I'm just here to talk about my experiences and stuff. Excellent. Yes. As well as a paranormal experiencer, you are the artist who depicts Mothman, my most favorite way I've ever seen Mothman ever. I love it so much. <laughs> my my uh, giant uh, cousin it replica. <laughs> yes, it's perfect. <laughs> He's adorable. Did um did Mike tell you I made him in uh Sims 4? No. <laughs> yeah. I have to see that. His name is she, Matthew. She tweeted it out on, on <laughs> Twitter. It's it's pretty good. Oh wow, nice. <laughs> yeah, he's a uh, he has a paranoid trait, so he could discuss conspiracy theories with other Sims. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> And he's currently combating a uh, alien invasion in one of the the towns. It's like a, a more recent 
edition called Pleasant uh, Strangerville. So that's that's fun. Man, The Sims has gotten a lot more advanced since I played. Oh yeah. When when I played, you could just build a a a neighborhood and you know drown your neighbors in your pool. Now you can can, you can still do that. Well, it's just a plant, so it's more like strange. It's more Stranger Things, Uh, uh, except nothing is really trying to eat you. Though it can kill you. I did see someone else die from being fighting the plant, so that was fun. Whoa! I'm trying not to kill Matthew though. (laughs) (laughs) Matthew Pleasant. I'll have to rerun his story and uh, stream it and put it on YouTube or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are deviating. This is going to get cut. Already, you see? No, seven <laughs> minutes in, it's all staying. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's kind of, it, it does fit with the theme. It, it is a Mothman-inspired something, so it's not completely out of left field. Right. <laughs> Just, you know, slightly off left. Anyway. We guys I'm talking about checkers. Checkers. Yeah. <laughs> The restaurant or the game? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Playing checkers at checkers. <laughs> there you go. So so let's talk about where where your experiences started. Was this something that you uh, experienced your whole life or was there a, a catalyst that, that kind of brought the experiences on and kept them around? Uh, two things. I grew up in a haunted house. And uh, spiritual awareness grew, uh, runs in my family on my father's side. My dad was a untrained medium. Things like to come to him when he was sick and they'd, you know, infect the house and have to get rid of them. That's how I learned how to exercise things. That was fun. Uh, and uh, the house itself had a portal slash vortex actually in my bedroom. So that was fun. Right in your room? Oh, no. Yeah, I was in my room, but it was it was one of those rare positive portals. Like when I would touch it, uh, you could feel it if you knew where it was, and it didn't feel negative. I mean, things it, it was kind of like a, uh, I guess you could say it was a exit ramp to someplace else, bigger and better. People just come through and just, they wouldn't stick around. So, just kind of like an overlap area between yeah. the the two realities. Yeah, like a Seven Eleven. So when you when you say portal, you're not you're not talking like big swirling vortex showing up on your wall. I'm assuming it's it's more of a something you you felt and experienced. Yeah, I never saw it physically because it never manifested physically. But multiple people would tell me that my room felt safe, and I can only assume it was because of that. It was a positive portal. Yeah, it's that's portal positive. <laughs> that's pretty cool because usually a lot of when people have that sort of thing, it's it's always got negative connotations to it. And even if it's not necessarily like like a negative haunting, it's it's does seem like they'll always talk about the cold spots or the uh, the the feeling of fear or th- you know things like that. And very rarely are are these things talked about uh, in in a positive way. So it's it's interesting that that you experience that. Well, I think what the funny thing about that is the rest of the house had cold spots and very cold rooms. My The room I spent most of my childhood in was one of them, and so was the master bedroom. Uh, both had um, things happen in them. Nothing really happened in my, my bedroom. I had that one when I was a teen up until I was an adult. Uh, but my parents' bedroom, the master bedroom, had – that's where all the big – infestations would come in when they looked for my dad when he was sick and my childhood bedroom is where the hands came out i don't think you mentioned the hands they were hands <laughs> so like what do you mean hands uh like okay. actual physical hands um i don't know i didn't see them it happened to my brother it's before i was born uh because my parents got the house in the 70s um and my brother remembers being woken up by our other sister debbie who was in the room with him and like freak out because she saw these like mat I don't know how big I guess they were man sized hands, like an adult man's hands coming out of the wall above my brother's head where he was laying down. And they said they were like greenish and kind of covered in like a slime. They were very and they were trying to grab him. Which is not fun. <laughs> no. That is so, a horror movie shit right there. Yeah. That's terrifying. A lot of stuff happened in that house before uh before I was old enough to recognize what was going on. Cause I never, 
really saw anything. I can't see spirits. I can only feel them. And if I close my eyes, I can see them. I can see them psychically. Um, but my, I have four siblings, all older. Uh, Jeanette and Debbie, the two oldest, experienced the most because they were old enough to recognize what was going on. Uh, and like some cliche, on everyone's 13th birthday, something happened didn't happen to me because I was actually hospitalized at the time. So I got away from that, <laughs> but we'll get into more of that. Cause, uh, you know, almost dying will put you in connect, put you in contact with some, with some things. Now you said that the, the portal in your room, uh, was positive. At least it felt that way enough for you to describe it that way. Now the cold spots in the house, did they have a negative feel to them? Yes. People did not like sleeping in my sister's room the childhood room or my parents' room. Most of the occurrences that happened to our friends happened in my sister's room. Like I think once a very religious friend of hers was staying over and she recalled figures at the foot of the, the cot she was sleeping in and they were grabbing her ankles. They didn't want her there. Wow. There were frequent instances of people sitting on the beds, you know, the usual stuff. And we actually had a, a lady in white. Uh, we think we actually traced the history of the house back to her as she lived there. I think she died, I'm guessing, during childbirth because they always heard the babies crying. And my mother found a portrait of her, uh, of the woman, when they first moved in there in the attic, along with the dress. Really? Unfortunately, they, th unfortunately, they threw them out because my mom had no sense of um, spooky posterity, but, you know. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. And my dad saw the woman in white the most. He was the first one to see her when they first moved in. He was doing a tour of the house and he was going up the stairs and he looked up and saw on the top landing was this young woman, maybe 20s, probably in her 20s, in a Victorian era like gown. I think it was like a high neck. It was really pretty. The way he described it, it really pretty. I'm guessing a wedding dress. And uh, he said, she looked down at him and he's like, oh, hello. And she just smiled and walked, crossed over into the master bedroom. And when he went up there, she wasn't there, of course, because, you know, spirits. But they think that uh, it's her children that they heard crying. Because my mom would hear babies crying more than my dad. Hmm. Now, do you know when your dad realized he had the ability to feel and see the spirit world? Uh, he'd always he'd always had it. Um, there was something very... I never met my his father. He... Uh, my paternal grandfather never met him, but he was very special, too, from what I understand. Um, no, Dad didn't really... I can't. Unfortunately, I can't ask either of my parents, because they, they were both dead. Uh, so, um, no, Dad, uh, he never really said anything about when, just that he always could. And he knew things. You know, people who just know things? He was one of them. Mm -hmm. Couldn't keep anything from him, unfortunately, because he just knew... <laughs> <laughs> and he would astral travel to prank his co-workers he had this amazing ability and he'd go there just to tease his co-workers I'm like dad seriously <laughs> how would you do that how would you describe that because that's something we've talked about and we're both fascinated with what astral travel yeah. well, he would just uh, decide he's like okay um, I think it was a female co-worker of his that they had a you know a, a pretty decent friendship or work work relationship because my dad was um, a uh, maintenance manager at the master post office where we were uh, where we lived and he said one he told her one day he's like i'm gonna come he's like i'm gonna come see you t tonight and she's like you can't do that well i'll be asleep or something or you, you're not gonna do it and he's like well you just wait so he goes to sleep travels wakes up goes to work and said there's like that was a nice red neck right night nightgown you were wearing and she's like oh, how'd you know and he's like i saw you i told you i'd come see you <laughs> wow he would prank his co-workers with astral travel <laughs> sounds like he had it down pretty good <laughs> he did because i also saw his doppelganger well my sister did my debbie saw him but i was in the living room okay this is a story it's a little long um everyone was in the it was myself my mother Debbie and Serena in the living room and Debbie was folding her laundry that she had just gotten up from the basement and she slept in the attic at the time. So she had to take her clothes up and the way the house was set up, it was one of the, like a, it was a Victorian farmhouse. So it had like all the rooms were connecting like a very ant farm kind of a thing uh, to pet as you 
go from the living room to the stairs, you can, there's the kitchen doors right there, like next to the stairs. And if you just look to the left, you could look into it. And Debbie just happened to glance over into the left, left into the kitchen, and she saw uh, a figure sitting at the counter reading a newspaper. The figure had the newspaper up, couldn't see its face, but it was dressed in our father's jeans and work shirt and was uh, eating milk and cookies. And Debbie just stood there for a minute and the figure lowered the paper and its face was pure white. Like it had no features. Like the whole thing was just, it was like, it was an astral body that she could see because she could see things I can't. And she's just like, well, all right, because, you know, it's that house. Things are going to be there. So she just went upstairs and my mom found the milk and cookies the next morning. My dad was asleep at the time, but I guess he had a craving. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I wonder if he did it on purpose or just maybe he did have a craving and his body astral projected itself into getting some milk and cookies. Yeah, I don't know if astral bodies can eat, but his did. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was certainly trying. He, he maybe was that's a, what happens to you, Mateo. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you astral travel to get some cookies? Oh, no, I eat in my sleep all the time. I'll get up and cook in my sleep. That's dangerous. You might want to have a bell or something. Yeah, it is. I have precautions. <laughs> Goodness. Yeah, it's scary. My sister would sleepwalk. That was fun. <laughs> I I do that every now and again too. Not not cooking, thankfully. I just I just short the circuits in my in my house while I sleepwalk. <laughs> what are you doing? Going around with a bat? <laughs> no, I I really have no idea. I'll just wake up in my kitchen. And I hear what wakes me up, what pulls me out of it is I hear the the fuse go off. And then I, I'll have this brief moment of awareness and then I'll wake up the next morning, you know, with with no recollection of it until I come out to the kitchen and I see the the clock on the microwave blinking midnight. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I've, man, I did it again. Son of a you- bitch must give off a lot of energy while you're sleeping you should be careful with that you might attract something you don't want yeah that's interesting mike how many times does that happen to where you've woken up and the power's been tripped uh two or three wow yeah recently or in your entire lifetime um they it's all happened probably in the last five years it's happened two or three times it's not a regular occurrence but well, still, I mean, were you like yeah. especially stressed when it happened? Did something trigger it? I don't recall. I don't know. Huh. I, I really don't remember. And it's it's one of those things where, um, like, it, it feels like a dream. So so even though I have that brief moment of awareness, it just feels like a dream, and I have no memory of walking back to my room or going getting back in bed, or actually getting out of bed for that matter. Uh, I just have the memory of hearing the the click of the fuse being triggered and then uh, i don't remember anything else until i wake up in the morning and i see the blinking clock and i'm like oh yeah i forgot about that but i have no idea what i do to trigger the fuse it's just that click of the fuse always wakes me up for that brief moment well you're either affecting it or something's turning it off for your own safety that's what i could think of yeah i have no idea it's but it's it's really really fucking weird and uh I, I, I don't have any explanation for it. I don't really have a history of sleepwalking. Uh, oh. It's happened occasionally in my youth. Um, but that is that I don't know. Sometimes like oh, really in the past five years or, or five or six years, probably um, I, I'll just get like a feeling like that I did something like like I just wake up with a feeling in the morning like I, I don't think that I stayed in bed all night but i have no evidence to back it up it's just one of those weird feelings you have Hmm. and no one's ever observed this no no i i don't wake anybody up well you're a courteous sleepwalker then yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i'm not i'm not mauling anybody in my sleep or tripping i hope not (laughs) where is this fuse box in location from your room in the kitchen is it closer in the kitchen or to your room the kitchen the kitchen is on the opposite side of the house and the way my house is set up it's kind of like a horseshoe shape um like the 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 layout 
So I can walk from my room, which is in the far corner on the other side of the house, walk out, walk across the living room, and then walk around the other side, and that's where my kitchen would be. And um, the fuse box is in the utility room off the kitchen. So I, and when I wake up, I'm usually standing facing the wall uh, where on the opposite side of the wall would be where the fuse box is in the utility room. So I'm facing the wall in the kitchen, but on the other side of that wall is where the utility box is. And when you partially wake up, you have no control or ability to fully wake yourself up? Yeah, it's just like a, a quick little flicker of awareness where um, when I hear that click sound, that's like what triggers me to, to it's it's like a, a a recording of a moment in time. Like I'll, I'll wake up and it's just like that thing happened. And I remember just hearing the click and looking at the wall and being confused. And then I don't remember anything else. Is there anything in your house? Like spiritually or, or mm -hmm. astrally, I mean, yeah. um, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I've had, I've had experiences with that stuff in the past at my, my parents' house when I was younger. Um, but in this house there, there's the occasional weird thing that'll happen. Um, but nothing, I, I wouldn't say that anything that would indicate a pattern hmm. that, that something was, was present. Um, most of the stuff even even though like even the really weird stuff that happens, I will tr usually try to blame on one of my cats. <laughs> <laughs> like I I forgot these bookshelves, and on the top uh the the top book the top of this one bookshelf, uh the very top of it is open, so the books are are just kind of freestanding on the ledge, and there's a few things on some of the books and. I woke up one morning and there were three or four books from the top that were on the ground. Nothing that was in front of the books was displaced. Nothing that was on top of the books was displaced, but the books were on the ground. I have no idea how that happened, but I'm, I'm blaming one of the cats. Well, if there's nothing in there, then it's this probably your sleepwalking is probably triggered by stress or something else that's bothering you yeah. so much that you need to get up and move. So, you know, I'd, I'd be, you know, be on the lookout for that. It's like maybe during, if you get stressed out again, which I hope not, uh, and it happens and you well, probably I, have a direct correlation. Honestly, I've, I've been the most stressed the past week that I've ever been like ever. And I haven't had any weird sleepwalking things, but hmm. we will see. Well, hopefully you I, won't. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you updated if, if yes. I, if I blow any fuses. <laughs> yes. Because I can't think of any other reason why. Because sleepwalking yeah. is is usually psychological, so yeah. that's what they say. <laughs> I do dabble in weird shit from time to time, though. So yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> who knows? There you go. Mm, problem solved. Weird shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> always blame the weird shit. Can't always blame the cats. You can blame yeah, the weird it's shit. A it, it makes me feel better blaming the cats. I'm like, I know it was that <laughs> asshole. He's jumping up there and knocking all my shit over. And mm. it, it's it's just really weird because there's other times. And, and it, it's always weird things knocked on the floor. So that's why I always blame the cats. Even even though, like, sometimes it'll be uh, books on a different bookshelf. Like, right in the middle, just three books will be on the ground. No that's rhymes and it's very precise knocking over. So they're really looking to pull some kind of nerve on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I, I, in my mind, it's the cat trying to climb things and then just knocking shit over and me not understanding <laughs> how they did it. It's <laughs> just some ninja cat shit. Yeah. Your cat's more graceful than mine. Then mine knocks everything over. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, We're getting one, off topic. Of my, yeah, it happens. <laughs> um, so hmm. the um, the way station thing, like your house being a way station, do you know? Do you know like the if there was a history of that sort of thing, or was it? Do you think maybe your dad being able to uh, have contact that that may have contributed to it? I think it might have uh, activated it because 
um, when I go by the house now, it's been completely renovated. It doesn't even look like my house. It doesn't feel the same. Meaning that the, probably the people who live there now have like zero sensitivity. And that's kind of a shame when you think about it. It's such a nice active spot and people are in there just dead in the head. But I think a lot of it uh, had to do with who was in the house at the time, too. Um, you know, that's an aspect of hauntings that I've never really considered. It, like, obviously, there's there's people that are more sensitive to um, to non-physical entities. They're able to to pick up on them and and uh, in some cases even communicate with them. But what it, I like, I never really considered that maybe hauntings uh, were experienced. Like the people that experience the hauntings, maybe they're experiencing the hauntings because they've got more sensitivity, and maybe that could contribute to the houses that are supposed to be hotbeds of activity that just all of a sudden go go dead, mm -hmm. and then nothing happens. No, that's actually a to my understanding, it's a common belief that the person inside, people inside the house, really factor into it, because you know we're all just batteries, and. If some people believe that spirits or entities exist just to either drain us or use us as mouthpieces for some reason or another, because there are some people out there that I kind of talk to who are very sensitive and everything happens to them. It's like they can go to houses that have no activity and all of a sudden something happens. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. We're all just uh, uh, antenna, really. That's why my dad would put off so much energy when he was sick because he had no control. He his uh, defenses were down so unfortunately he was such a strong beacon a lot of stuff that he pulled in was extremely negative like very negative so much so that i think one of his favorite entities who would keep coming back despite my best attempts well, probably because my mom would keep putting a mirror next to his side of the bed <laughs> uh, attached itself to a, a portrait that my sister and i brought into our current home from the house uh, and I dealt with that uh, about a year or two ago. That was that wasn't fun. We kept it in our bedroom, um, and my sister would start seeing uh, figures, and she had all these horrible nightmares that felt very real. And even I saw some things too, um, like, like shadow I, figures or shadow people. I saw a legit hag. Legit oh, hag. Yep. Was it? Did they uh, go along with sleep paralysis or was that independent? Um, I was in a state of what could have been sleep paralysis, but she was no near, nowhere near me. She was across the room by the windows. Like, I couldn't be sure if I was really looking because I just happened to open my eyes. And, they, you know, when you're really tired, but your eyes open for no reason. I'm yeah. like, oh, hey. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, that's not cool. I'm going to close my eyes again. <laughs> yeah. like, I didn't feel anything coming from her. Like, she wasn't trying to do anything. But it was like, oh, hey, okay, I'm, I'm going back to sleep now. I don't, I don't, it's like, I'm too tired for this, too tired. <laughs> Let's backtrack a little bit. This entity, you said it attached itself to this portrait. What made you think it was the same entity? Would it appear as, as the same way at the house you grew up with your dad? Or Well, I only associated it because it was attached to an agent of my father. And ah. there were other things that we brought in from the house that had zero attachments. Uh, what I ended up doing was after I decided deciphered what it was and where it's coming from. Uh, I took it out of the frame, took it out to the back. I salted it, purified it, and then we set it on fire because salt and burn. <laughs> and I buried it in the backyard and it's still there because the earth took it back. Did it, did that help that get rid of? Oh yeah. It's stuck now. Like they'll have to uproot this entire complex before it is released. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had people give me flack for, uh, quote unquote, releasing it for someone else's problem. Like, well, if that does happen, it's someone else's problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to that type of thing, that's the only thing you can really do, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime I've but, ever had to get rid of something or do any type of cleansing like that, I never gave any thought of to where it goes, which is kind of shitty. But as long as it's out of my house, I have family. So, I mean, it's yep. a very protective thing. I just don't want to be bothered. <laughs> yeah. But according to another friend of mine who is just starting to realize he's sensitive, he's uh, he has, um, you know what psychometry is? No. Okay. Psychometry is described as the ability to touch an object and pick up its, uh, I guess you could say, its psychic imprint. It's history in he a can, way. Yeah. He can read objects. Now, 
he's in the middle of something pretty intense, but he doesn't want me to talk about it because the thing he found is afraid of being destroyed. So, um, so maybe I'll get him to talk to you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but he said that he saw this, he called it a plinth, uh, like a stone edifice or a, a marker over the spot where I buried the thing. And he's like, that thing ain't going there. It's frozen. It's like, that's, he's not moving. You trapped it. So it didn't go anywhere. It stayed right here. It's just contained. So don't worry about that. So those naysayers can just go away. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> now, how did it appear at the old house? If it was the same entity, did it, what made it such a negative entity? It was just, it. if black holes could walk, it felt like a black hole. It was just this dense nothing and it just sucked out everything like it was always cold you could just feel it and it pulled uh, mm -hmm. on people it felt like like you know the, like undertow or something right it's, it's very unpleasant i mean i'm 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 glad it's not in the house anymore mostly i mean it probably attached him to, to it probably wanted me because i think next to my father i am the strongest because i actually bothered to develop these skills uh, my other siblings didn't really, didn't really bother. They like, they kind of, they didn't deny it, but they didn't let it grow either. I also have a, uh, stronger bond with the spiritual because of my connection to death. And that segues into a next series of questions, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you did, you did mention that you had a brush with death as, uh, uh, was it when you were a child or were you, were you a teenager? Um, a bit of both in that magical place. I was 12. Okay. What what happened there? Well, I um, was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis when I was 11. It was stress-induced. That's a that's a completely un, unconnected story to the paranormal. Um, and it was so bad that I had to get surgery because I, I could have died. I was losing that much weight. I also was in a uh, depressive state. I was suicidal. So I was kind of, I guess for all I know, I was willing it to kill me. Um, and they had to completely remove my large intestine. And then during a moment of when I was supposed to be recovering, I was having a very bad day. Like there was just pain for no reason. I was ready to say, screw it. And as I'm, I remember laying in the bed and I had my eyes closed and I'm thinking to myself, this is it. I can finally go. I'm free. And then a voice says to me in my head, real low, not yet. And then I feel fine. I come out of it. I recover. My father insists it was God. I'm like, it wasn't God. That was not God. And then my mom's like, oh, must it was your, was your grandmother. I'm like, it wasn't grandma. It wasn't anyone. I know who that was. I didn't say death until about four or five years later. When I predicted my first death, uh, I told Mike about that one. Um, yeah. Would you mind getting into that? No, I don't mind. Right. Um, my, I was with at my, I was at my friend Jeff's house and our mutual friend Katie had had, she had a son. He was maybe not even a year old. He was still like, I guess small enough to still fit in a carrier. Not really. I don't think he could walk. I didn't really know him very well. His name was Michael. And Katie ran off to do whatever. She's a teenage mom. She's not going to be the most responsible. And she left Michael with me and Jeff. And Jeff and I are just literally watching Michael and his carrier sitting on the dining room table. And we're just talking. And then out of nowhere, like in a pause in the conversation, I look at Michael and I'm like, he's going to die. You know, like, and Jeff's, I don't remember what he said, but it was probably, he was a pretty weird kid too. So we were all, he's like, well, I hope not, you know. And uh, two weeks later, Michael died of a crib death, which was really unfortunate. And his mother, for years and years that I had her on Facebook, would uh, memorial, uh, mention the death, the anniversary of his death. And I always felt so bad because I'm like, what if I had told her it would have made a difference, you know? But Yeah. That what, what do you say to somebody who says that to you, though, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, but she did become a better mother, but I wish it didn't have to come around that way. Cause you know, that kid didn't do anything to anyone. And I know you can't avoid SIDS, but still. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like, Oh, it's like, why would I know that? 
And then I started putting two and two together as I got older because I began to feel stronger around funerals, funeral homes, or people who were dying. According to some people that I, that I know who are similar to me, they're, um, it's psychopompic behavior. You guys know what psychopompery is, right? I do not. Okay. Psychopomps are uh, people who usher the dead over to their side. They help people die or they help them after they're dead. Um, but people who have psychopompic, uh, I guess, abilities gain uh, energy or strength from the energy put off by things that are dead or dying. So on a, if there's a large, like say there's like a large funeral going on at the nearby cemetery, I feel like I'm drugged. Hmm. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy, but it feels like a drug. And I'm like, and it always happens when I'm driving. I'm like, this is not good. This is not good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to pass out of the wheels. It feels, it, and it's kind so of, you get kind of hazy. It feels good. It feels like good morphine. It feels really good. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, obviously, uh, it's not something I seek. Uh, just for when it hits, it's like, oh wow, that's kind of nice. It's just a nice. It's a, it's a rush, but it's the, the kind of rush that you just kind of want to lay down and enjoy. But yeah, um, that's one thing I can do. Uh, and apparently, I also have the ability to make deals with death. I don't use that very often because it always comes with a penalty. Um, anyone who tells you that this universe doesn't have a balance has no idea what they're talking about. Life for, you know, a life for a life, basically. If something has to die or something, or something has to live, something has to die. Uh, first time I did it, I had a pet rat uh, in the zooming and she wasn't doing very well. And I remember just saying to the air, it's like, please let her go. She died the next day. Now that could have been coincidence. And that's what I thought at first. I'm like, oh, all right, well, you know, she's not suffering anymore. I guess she was going to die anyway because she wasn't, she wasn't doing well. And then my dad got sick because he had congestive heart failure. So he got pneumonia fairly often. And I wasn't ready to let him go. And I, and I, I remember sitting in my basement, which is where the my computer was. And I'm saying, like, just it's like if you just let him live, you know, it's it's too soon. He can't go yet. And almost as soon as I thought that, uh, I heard a scream outside. It was uh, coming from my neighbor's house, Carly. And I go up to the porch and I look over and she's on the ground on, in the road holding something. And her husband's with her trying to get her off the road. Uh, Carly had two pet chihuahuas, Peanut and Butter. Uh, Peanut was her baby. And unfortunately, it was Peanut that she was holding. He had been struck by a hit and run. My dad lived for a little while longer. So I always felt kind of bad about that too, because it was a good dog. Hmm. And at that point I was like, this isn't coincidence. I got, I can't, I can't use this as lightly as I have been. Not that I never did it lightly, but you know, it's harder to ask for a death than to ask for a life. Because when yeah, my mom was, everybody wants to hold on to, yeah. to life or, or people they love. And, and very rarely are they, they asking for the, the, someone that they know or care about or, or or even really a stranger just as wishing death upon them. It's, it's, um, I mean, like, like you said with, with your, your pet, when, when it was suffering and you just wished for, for death, I I've seen that before as well, but in the, at the same time, it doesn't, it's, it's never, uh, like, especially with people, it's never, it's never genuine. Like you want their suffering to end, but you don't want to lose them. And, and you want some, some middle ground where, where everybody can be happy and it just, it doesn't work that well. Well, that's a nice thought, but it's not realistic. And that's what I don't apply right. to that to myself because my mother had really bad dementia and it robbed her of everything she was. Like she couldn't speak and she was a very chatty person, you know, before. And to see a strong, independent woman like she was to be reduced to, basically a toddler i wanted her to be able to go because she would be free people don't realize that when they wish for someone to live they're wishing them to live for them not for the person right yeah the want for someone to live is a selfish thing and that's okay 
but it's just human nature. Yeah, but it also shouldn't be a bad thing for someone to wish for release or hope that the person, because because if you love them, you want them to be pain, be in less pain, right? I mean, that's always what I thought. But I have a very apparently I have a very uh, comfortable relationship with death and dying. I mean, I have no fear of it myself. Obviously, I mean, it's a little intimidating to realize that. This one nap could be your last one, but, you know, that's life and death, and that happens. And given my, my, my health condition is not much better, so I could pop off from a stomach virus. <laughs> so yeah. that's really terrible. But, you know, you, you get real comfortable with the idea of it, and the best you can do as someone in position is to make sure the people who are living are, you know, cared for, you know, through uh, death planning, but... I don't really talk about my connection with death very often because a lot of people think I'm full of it because <laughs> yeah. they think it's like it's like death's not a not a person I'm like I didn't say it was a person <laughs> he's an entity yeah, I went through that with studying serial killers a little bit and it got a lot of raised eyebrows when people see your book collection and you know you kind of I don't know I never felt like I had to tell anybody that I wasn't glorifying them at all but I just no. felt it was something, you know, that's an aspect of humanity I think everybody should look at. Mm hmm. Because you never know. Yeah. And it's like, what drives a person to be that way? And you, you want to know. It's just, it's the thirst for knowledge. It's, that should be normal. But it's like, oh, serial killers. Oh, you freak. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Death's just part of that game. I got, I got to read about that and know about that as well if I'm going to study that. Mm hmm. Scared of it or not, it's something that happens. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's what happens. Uh, but those are most of my death things. Uh, I do have a rather nice uh, altar to him on the top of my desk, which I can send pictures to you guys later if you want. Yeah. Uh, got some bone replicas up there, some stuff from Spencer's because they always have the spooky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Halloween's my favorite holiday. It's lots of lots of opportunities to redecorate <laughs> <laughs> all year round. Keep it up all year I, round. Keep it spooky. That's, yeah, yeah. I, I've got, I've, we've got Halloween decorations up. Like, not, not our house is not a, a Halloween themed house, but there's certain things that were Halloween decorations that we keep up year round. And like, we've got um, skull garlands. Oh, that, cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah things, <laughs> things, just things like that. And I've, I've got a. Uh, uh, I guess it's not really Halloweeny, but kind of in in that vein. I've got the uh, the replica doll of Blade from Puppet Master. Oh, sitting just above nice. my TV in my living room. He is unfortunately the only recognizable one from that series. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's the coolest knows. one. Well, he is the coolest one. That's why yeah. people remember him. Yeah. Uh. Well, we also my sister and I were witches, so we celebrate uh, Samhain. You know. Uh. That's Halloween for you, you plebs. Uh, <laughs> um, so we have a lot of uh, spooky Halloween decorations that we put up, like a candelabra with spider webs on it or something, uh, for when we have dinner on the 31st. So that's nice. nice. <laughs> yep. That's we awesome. always have a really good setup. Like I'll take some of my, I have a really nice uh, large figure of Death who wears. Um, a Nubis necklace that has a bit of my father's ashes in it. Uh, I take him, and he's usually the centerpiece. It's very nice, very good. So October is a big deal for us. No, I have to ask you, as somebody who who does these things, practices these things, is knowledgeable and in, in the spirit world and stuff like that. I was having a, a conversation with an older gentleman friend of mine who's from the Middle East. Unfortunately, he talks a lot about the the troubles over there and. And uh, he sticks to the negative a lot. And one thing he said to me I found very interesting. With all these people who are shooting everybody, all these random shootings, he says, it's, I just don't understand why people aren't concerned about their spirits anymore. These guys get arrested and they go to jail and they just they don't really care about that. Do you think people are spiritually deaf these days? S spiritually deaf it's or dead? Just dumb, maybe. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Everyone around here, anyone who takes that sort of thing so lightly is 
I don't know why there's such a, a rash of people just murdering and killing. I mean, we can blame the political environment, which doesn't help, but there's just this so much hate and it's, it spreads. It is like, it, it can, it infects the astral and that, that can affect people's brains. But in terms of spirits, as in like salvation, is that what you're referring to? Just any, anything about their own spirits, their own spirituality. They give no thought to, you know, maybe I should, okay, if I have no problem with shooting a bunch of people morally, because I don't give a shit about these people, why do you think people don't even think, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this because it'll have an impact on my own spirit or my own soul or whatever happens in the afterlife or where, or where I go or, or anything like that? Well, I would think if they're willing to kill a bunch of random people, they don't really care about that. Like you said, they're spiritually dumb yeah, and deaf. They Something inside them has died if they're so callous. I wonder if that's a condition to where that part of their mind is just completely null. Yeah, that's why I call them deadheads. Yeah, it's so unfortunate. Not, nothing going on up there. there there's an idea <laughs> that the human, um, the hu- that human beings used to uh, have these like, basically – psychic abilities for lack of a better term but that over time as you know we evolved and became more civilized and started relying more on technology and and ultimately devolved into capitalism and glorifying possessions and greed and things like that uh that we we lost this connection you're talking about the collective consciousness yeah yeah Exactly. And, and not only the collective consciousness, but our ability to to sense these beings that are outside of our physical reality. I mean, you, you look at all of the ancient religions and, and mythology and the, the practices, and a lot of them had a lot to do with communing with spirits. Their mm-hmm. their holy men or their priests would would undergo rituals so that they could communicate with these other beings. And their mythology is filled with with stories of these spirits or uh, ghosts or angels or fairies or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And as as we became I, I don't I'm trying to frame this in a way that's that's not negative towards the, the modern human race, but it's really hard. It, they're um, disconnected. It's yeah. disjointed. They. Yeah. And it, it, it seems like when we started to remove ourselves from the natural order of the world, that's when this ability that was innate in all of us started to deteriorate. You know, we, we started to put ourselves above the natural world. Like the natural world is ours to control and ours to reap as we please. And, and it's no longer something that we need to live in harmony with and, and, honor and and you know for everything you take you give something and and now it's just take 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 consequences be damned and and you know we're we're here to make money we're we're here to to do our jobs and we've lost the connection and i think with with that connection that we've we've lost i think that kind of makes the average modern human kind of look down on on those people that have these experiences or have these abilities because it's so outside of the norm. Now what used to be something that was revered and honored is now looked at as being weird or lies or, or, or something that's being perpetrated by a con artist. And, and it's, there's just, there's so much evidence for these abilities existing, but it's not really anything that you can quantify so because there's no way to actually prove a lot of this stuff, it's just thrown out the window as, as being bullshit. Mm, yeah. The problem with that is I don't know where people started thinking that spiritualism. Now, here's OK. I'm going to go from a slight tangent here, but it's somewhat related. And do you also find it hypocritical for people to be religious, but also laugh at the idea of spirits and entities and ghosts? And yes, whatnot? it drives me <laughs> fucking bonkers. I can't stand it. It's like, OK, OK, so you're telling me that you believe in an invisible man in the sky who for some for all con- con- sense of purposes is a bearded white man. This should tell you something. Uh, 
And yet you think that grandma over here is just going to go to heaven and never be seen again. How is that respectful to your grandmother? Wouldn't you want to see her again? (laughs) Just to say nothing about the belief in angels either. Like, what do you Mm -hmm. think angels are? You believe in angels. Are, Are they just these magical things that are created by by your God or is there more to it? Well, I think angels actually are a, I believe angels, demons, and fairies, and it, as a consequence, aliens, quote unquote, mm-hmm. aliens are of the same uh, planar family. Yeah, absolutely. And th- this like, is something I've been rallying about for, for years now. So when whenever I say angels, I usually say angelics. I do communicate with some angelics. Uh, um. But they've fallen by the wayside because I, I do use them as a protective chant, though. Uh, like I'll, I have um, five of them. It's um, Osriel, Michael, Cassiel. Wait. Osriel, Gabriel, Cassiel, Michael, Lucifer, if you can believe it. Um, even though I know Lucifer is just Samael, but, you know, semantics. Uh, <laughs> he prefers Lucifer. And I say that when I need protection. I added Cassiel pretty recently because he kind of rounds off as a more, he's described as being a human sympathizer, I guess you could say. He likes, he likes people. So, uh, but I like the idea of balances, which is why I prefer Michael Lucifer to be, because they're opposites, uh, theologically anyway. And Azrael is the, uh, I'm not sure if he's Persian or Muslim. Uh, he's the official quote unquote angel of death. Um, a lot of people who revere death refer to him as Osriel, like as is his title. Cause everyone's like, Oh, you can't say death. Cause that's weird. I'm like, I say death because I'm talking about death. If I'm talking about Osriel. I'm <laughs> saying Osriel. <clears throat> and yes, when I say death, I do think of someone that the Grim Reaper who's telling your dinner party guests to shut up. Cause I talk too much Americans. <laughs> 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 that's exactly what I love that idea of him. <laughs> Cause if I was death, I'd be tired of him too. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. It's got to be exhausting dealing with us assholes. Oh, he's actually really chill because, you know, you you live forever. You, you have time means nothing. But I'm deviating. What, did I, what was I saying? Talk about angels? Oh, yeah. Angels, angelics. Yeah, yeah. Angelics is being cousins. I call them cousins of the classic demon, not so much the, you know, the devil made me do it demon, which is uh, silly. Are, it's absolutely silly. But it's not to say that demons are not mischievous, which is why they're cousins of the Fae. Right. Well, they could all be the same thing. And it's I've I've <laughs> heard it described by others who who have the ability to perceive uh, those types of beings that it's it's not so much uh, good and evil. It's it's more the the vibrations that they exist through. That it's more um, you you'd consider something like as having higher vibrations if it if it was more of a not necessarily benevolent but more of a um like a giving type of entity versus uh the lower or the negative ones which which draw from other beings the, the like they pull the energy from them like the, the ones that would uh drive power through hauntings or or possession that that mm-hmm. sort of thing well i have had a truck with fairies before a lot <laughs> and i will tell you that you're right none of them are quote unquote good or evil however you can charm any fairy by just simply you know don't just take make sure you give uh they like to um they like it, it's good to favor them like leave little gifts for them because yeah. you'll get goodness in return um but in reference to purely negative entities that are out there to uh you know, ruin your day. They definitely exist. Um, where was I going? <laughs> You'll find I do this a lot. Uh, I, I have a lot of, a lot of thoughts on everything. That's why I need people to direct me. <laughs> I, I do the same thing. I'm, I'll, I'll go on a rant on the show and then I'll forget why I went on the rant to begin with. And it's like, you asked me a question and I just answer something you probably could ask me later. What was the first question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now to get to my point, what was my point again? I forget. Exactly. What was yeah. my point? <laughs> what was the point? I'm legit asking now what we were, what we were talking about. We we're talking about, well, you the, said something about 
yeah, the, the not being, positive and or not yeah. positive, but higher, lower entities. Oh yeah, there's definitely levels. Um, uh, I know a couple people who have claimed to have been in communication with demons, usually the lessers, because the lesser ones will lie their their heads off to you just to sound impressive. <laughs> yeah, they, because they're coming through. Like, no, no, seriously. I know everybody else says this, but I'm I'm Satan. That's that's me. Totally, totally me. And and I think a lot of the, because in a lot of cases you will hear they'll they'll mention Satan and Beelzebub and and all the the classic devil names, and I I think it's just because they know what will trigger people. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you know what? We're yep. aware of what those names do to people, especially people that are aware of of uh, Abrahamic mythology. So mm-hmm. let's let's go with with these hoary old chestnuts and and get them to to buy into our bullshit meanwhile my name's lewis and and i'm i'm really a big geek and all the other demons kick my ass but when i'm talking to you i'm fucking satan it's like, you're on a different city and you're i'm like, the no. granddaddy of them all motherfucker it's like oh really well then do this uh, i'm not in the mood <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd, I'd rather not it's like it's like you just need to it's like how dare you judge me it's like how dare you try to trick me <laughs> <laughs> but I would rather I'd rather have dealings with Lewis the demon nerd than anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I bet he's a swell guy when you get past his rough exterior. <laughs> he's got too many wedgies in demon school and he just he's taking it out on us gullible humans. Can you blame <laughs> He just wants to make balloons, that's all. That's his... yeah, he, he's 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 Poor a Lewis. he's a balloon artist. <laughs> oh man. That's a picture. Waiting to be drawn. I might have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> a demon making it. Louis, <laughs> Louis the balloon artist. <laughs> and like a Lord of the Rings t-shirt or something. Yeah. Oh, gotta be. <laughs> Taped up glasses, everything. Poor Louis. So I, I'm kind of curious because, so you were talking about the, uh, your old place, your, your parents' house being like a, a way station. Yeah. And uh, with, and, and, over the history of the show, Mateo has has talked a, a lot about his experiences and and how didn't you describe your mom's house as like a way station? Yeah, that's exactly the word I use for it. It's, yeah. it's just a place where a lot of spirits come and go. There's there's not too many that are familiar. I don't think I've ever had one feel familiar to me. It's always something new, and it's just a constant thing there. Like I've said before, it almost feels noisy being there. It's very stressful. Oh, I'd, I'd like that. I miss it. I hate how dead it is here. There's like nothing going on, really. <laughs> that stuff didn't bother me too much. But ever since I had children and, and the upbringing that I had, I just I, I do everything I can to keep that stuff away from here. I mean, I, even after my dad passed, I felt that he had come back a couple times. And, and I, I know that I not on purpose, but I know things tailed him. I know things followed him from wherever he came from and they were bad. I knew they mm-hmm. were bad. So I even had to do things and tell him, I'm sorry, but I'm closing whatever way you're using, you know, and I, and I allowed that to happen until mm-hmm. I had my children. And I was like, that's it. You got to do something when you find sewing needles, lighters and thumbtacks in your, you know, two months old crib. You're like, no way. Oh, that's fairy activity. Really? Actually. Yeah. You know, just put some bells up. You'll be fine. Hmm. I'm serious. Bells. We Fairies don't like bells. <laughs> That's interesting. That's good to know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I am a, my household is open to the fairies, so I don't have any iron or bells in my house because I, it's rude. <laughs> oh, yeah. They definitely won't want to come in if that stuff's around. No. No. But uh, if you've, it does sound like fairy activity, even if it's spiritual activity, bells will help. And it, I don't know how, well, if you have older children who might see things, if you give them a bell, like just hang up one on, like on their wall and tell them, if you see anything, shake this and the thing will go away. And it's true. Uh, I, while I don't have bells, I do have those uh, dancer belts with the coins on them. Mm-hmm. And things do come to me. I have a lot of visitations on when things just start getting really wild, like out there when the, when the planes are vomiting up things. I if something comes, I shake my my the, the belts because they're right above my head on, on the wall over my bed, and they go away. 
because like it's like I just want to sleep. Go away. <laughs> Would you you've noticed that how things activity comes in waves? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's because there are so many rips in the tradition called the veil. There are a lot of tears in the veil, and I've witnessed it in action before, and it's wild. You ever look down a road on a hot day and you got that heat haze? Yeah, yeah, that's clear it smokiness. Looks like, yeah, it kind of looks like that. Hmm. But the things that ha- okay, another thing that happened around the house, like, uh, before we moved out, my friend Julia was living with us. She had a, just, my parents had a big thing. They uh, would pull in a lot of people, like, who were displaced or they're home or homeless. So that's just normal. Uh, but she was living with us and she was also sensitive. We actually uh, went on a, a group. We we had a couple of friends. This is a mild deviation. We had a couple of friends who were having attachments and we were called in, literally called in to get rid of them. So that was fun. That was my first psychic battle. That was interesting. But moving away from that, Julie and I were sitting on the sidewalk in front of my house and the house on the left used to belong to an old woman, Miss Higgins, and she had died, and the house was actually currently abandoned at the time. And I remember and Joy just sitting there, and it's really warm, and we happen to look. I look over at the Higgins house, and I'm like, Joy, do you see that? And she looks over, and there's like this uh, arcing heat haze that comes from the back of the from the backyard and splits through the Higgins house, making it look warped, like a, through like a, like a, if you're looking at the bottom of a, the bottom of a glass or something at something. And it stretched over to across the road and cut off in there. So it was like being in a half in like a dome of weird. And when things would across the way would cross, there's a cat and it passed from the, uh, the division where the heat haze stopped and the dome dome began and when it came through, we couldn't see it anymore. We didn't see it again until it popped to the other side where it stopped. <laughs> and we heard fairies singing. And it was it was amazing. And that heat haze lasted all summer. I wow. call it heat haze, but it was a, it was a split. There was a it was a bubble of it doesn't surprise me that it was encompassing my house all the way to the backyard where we heard the singing. Hmm. I mean, I don't know where it cut off. Like, I don't know if it was behind the house across the way, but it just, we stayed in that bubble all summer and it was just so much happened. M- a lot of activity. Some circles that I used to roll in would actually predict when there would be large, um, I believe crypt, cryptozoa is referred to as a flap, which is a silly word, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, there's flaps. So it's like, why do you call it that? Stupid. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a better word. There has to be. I, so, you know, I discovered, I'm like, did you just, it's like, oh, well, when Mothman shows, like a Mothman flap, I'm like, why? Because he flies? No, this is what they call it. I'm like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> call it an occurrence or a, a pattern, not a flap. Mm-hmm. Like, inst- I start flapping my hands around because that's what it makes me think of. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably going to be some cryptos who I'll just hate after this, but whatever. Um <laughs> But they, like they could predict when there would be uh, massive shifts. I think one happened in 2015. Uh, I think uh, last year too. These are just things I've noticed. I haven't spoken to these people in a long time, but they would be like, uh, just like at this point in time, there's going to be a massive explosion of spiritual activity, and then it'll go away again for a while. Like locusts will like come out every seven years, hmm. <laughs> kind of like that. It's kind of, it's, it's weird. I know, I think astrologists can pick up on it too, but I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily an astrological, uh, I guess, trigger. It could be, but. Mm. <laughs> we had a friend on a while ago who talked about uh, these little people is what they call them. She's on a reservation in Canada where she was seeing these things. And she said they're responsible for pesky things that would go on in the house. Typical poltergeist stuff, moving stuff. And, and just taking things. Uh, what would you describe that as with your knowledge? It was interesting to hear her, you know, from her relatives and the natives of the area and how they described it. But what what would you describe that entity as? Something that's just moving shit, hiding shit? 
just to me that all sounds like just fairy activity because if they're little people, you know, traditionally people refer to the fairy as the good people, the green people, the little people. Uh, and especially in, um, is this a, in a American reservation or a Canadian? Canadian. Canadian. Oh yeah. Those uh, cultures are going to have a lot of those little, uh, little peskies, piskies. Um, I've heard a lot about, uh, the certain areas up there that have pretty much that little, little people who come in and I guess you'd call them those brownies, but not really. Mm -hmm. Anytime I hear of any kind of infestation of similar looking entities, I'm like, that's fair activity. (laughs) Because it's so, I mean, they're not spirit. I mean, they're not spirits in the sense that they were people once. Although some, I think I read somewhere that some cultures believe that certain, uh, People in tribes or, or communities do become these things. Wow! I mean, think think of how Wendy, the Wendigo is formed. Similar concept, but mm-hmm. less uh, like it's malignant. I couldn't tell you what cultures. These are just passing things that I read. I absorb a lot, but I don't remember half of it. <laughs> yeah, same here. It's a curse. <laughs> I hate it. Mm-hmm. It's like I can retain only so much. So, what attracts fairies in? Because it's. it's a lot of people complain about this thing. It sounds like uh, half the people who say they have a ghost are probably dealing with fairies. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if, if one thing, if it's uh, reservations are usually their protected land. Um, are you talking about like a uh, native reservation or like a reservation that's in like forested land? Like a native reservation. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I think in that case... It's probably a combination of fairy activity and spirit activity. Because just think of what has to go into the making of those reservations, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of displacement. So there's probably a lot of, like, I guess you call them chaos uh, portals or something. Like, there's spots where the energy is a little more wild. It's not tame, probably because it's not protected. Um, I think that they should, uh, these people should probably look into uh, local protection rights or whatever like make sure the cultures uh culture will always have something it's like oh well if you've um it's like like i told you with the bells you know it could be negative fairy activity but if you have bells it's a ward um gold bells are a good thing they don't have to be pure gold but brass bells another good one Uh, but just look into the folklore that's the word i was like really for the folklore that'll that'll usually help I don't know a lot about Canadian folklore. I just know that it's common in uh, native communities or cultures to have some variation of a little person or something like that that is uh, tricksters. They're tricksters, essentially. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But they, if they look at a local folklore culture, they can find ways to ward against them. Or the best way to do it is leave things out for them and it'll distract them. <laughs> like hmm. uh, food. I give food all the time. Like if I bake bread, I'll put bread outside. I'll put fruit outside. Hmm? Isn't there a myth like if you leave Hmm? uh, like a a pile of marbles or something that that they have to count them and that's a good way to keep them distracted? That's one myth. Like anything that needs to be counted in like matchsticks is a popular one Uh, or coin. Anything that it comes in a numerous amount is one way to distract them. That's that's pretty much a worldwide uh, belief. Now, I've never tried it because I'm not trying to distract them. I'm trying to pull them in. Um, but I can, that is a myth. If I might plug my friend's book real quick, Absolutely. because he does talk a lot about this. Uh, I think I told you about him before, Mike, uh, Joshua Kutchen. Uh, he has a book called, uh, where is it? I actually have it over here. Thieves in the night where he talks about the, uh, um, history and folklore surrounding both alien and fairy abductions. And it's really big. Well, it's not really big. It's, it's a good read. Uh, he starts with uh, fairy lore and it talks about uh, things like uh, changelings. Uh, it's, it's mostly about child abductions, but it does have to cover a lot of things like, oh, we'll do this. It'll keep your baby safe. But it's really good. You can find it on Amazon. Um, I think it's amazing. I really like his work because he focuses heavily on the correlation between fairies and uh, aliens, as well as uh, uh, cultural placations like um, of food and drink, like, you know, like 
I, I haven't read that one yet. I think he gave it to me. I can't remember. He also did a book on uh, supernatural smells. You know, like how sometimes you'll smell like phantom smells. Like, say, uh, someone, you, uh, there's like an old man's spirit in a house, and like they say they can smell pipe tobacco or something, something like that. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. I remember so, hearing stories about, um, a lot of people with with that have religious experiences, um, especially relating to Mary, uh, will often report smelling roses, mm-hmm. flowers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they touched on that in uh, what was it? Um, why can't I think of the word? The the movie. Uh, Gabriel Byrne was a priest who looked into a stigmata. 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 Yeah. They referred to it's like you know they whenever when she'd come out of that she'd say that she smelled flowers. So the, yeah, that's that's pretty common. <laughs> yeah, I love that flick. I watched it all the time. <laughs> it's like why can't I think of it? It's like oh, she has a flick. Oh, it's stigmata. <laughs> Well, Gabriel Bryan, I, I, I'm a big fan of his, so when, I remember him being the the detective in that mm-hmm. movie. Was it Patricia Arquette? I can't remember. I think it might have been. Yeah, it was. was. Yeah, okay. Okay, so memory's not that terrible. But yeah, that was also a good one. Yeah. Um, I like that one a lot. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's normal. Flowers. Um, I actually had a weird phantom smell happen to me once uh, that I still have no explanation for. I was drawing a portrait of someone that I admire. He's a comic book artist. And when I was done, it was just a pencil drawing on copier paper. And I'm like, why does this smell like men's cologne? The drawing smelled like men's cologne. Now, I've never met him, so I can't confirm or deny if I was smelling him, which would be weird. But, <laughs> but I was like, why is this happening? <laughs> so I don't know. Sometimes they have a reason, sometimes they don't. And this one still haven't figured out why. Yeah, that's kind of always been my mom's mode of operation when it comes to her being sensitive or being able to sense things. A big part of it is the smell. Mm-hmm. She was able to identify when my dad came to visit her after he passed away because he, he had a cat that had a, a very particular cat litter. It was very floral. Oh, she had a spiritual cat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, whenever, like my dad still floats around and I, he was a heavy smoker, so I'll smell, um, cigarettes and, uh, my mother, cause she passed only in March. So, uh, and we have a portion of both their ashes on our house altar. So they have a link. They can come and see us whenever they want to. My mom came to see me not long after she died. And I, I, she sat on my bed and, um, moved some of my hair behind my ear. Like she used to do when I was a kid and I smelled her perfume. I smell it sometimes. That's I know she's awesome. around. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. got to be her around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt bad that I had to. I don't know. I don't know how else to put it, but I think I don't think I banished my dad from coming around or anything like that. But I, I, I'm glad he listened to you know when I told him he couldn't come around. But mm-hmm. I, I wonder if he would come around normally and visit, you know, without any attachment. It being some type of positive experience, if if he could control it, I guess. Well, as I'm saying, he might not be aware that he has attachments. Mm-hmm. And that's one, then, that's one thing I said, you know, when I I had to talk to him about it, you know, I don't know if you're aware. I know that if you were, you wouldn't want to come back and bring anything. Were you able to determine where he was coming from? No, not at all. I, I just, there was a, a, the way that happened is that there was a few things that were very specifically related to him that would happen, certain things that I'd find pulled out and I'd be like, okay, that's probably my dad, you know. So I wouldn't worry about that. But there's a few things that happened that were scary, that were very negative. I remember sitting in uh, the, our kitchen at where we were living at the time, and there's a back door in the kitchen that led outside, and we had it open slightly. And I was sitting in the kitchen with my wife. We were by ourselves. And, uh, I mean, it, it was like a, a row of men had sledgehammers every three feet and it started from the very front of the house all the way down the side of the house along the kitchen wall and stopped at the door and the door swung open really hard when it got there and oh, I, wow and yeah i i got my normal feelings and i knew that was bad and then just more stuff with finding weird stuff in the crib and just odd, odd sounds all the normal stuff and i told him you know after that you know when i felt he was around the, the next time i told him you got to get out of here and you can't be coming back and I told him, if you didn't know that, I'm sorry, but just the fact that you didn't know means you can't come here. Do you have anything that used to belong to him? A few things. I have his ashes. 
Okay. Uh, what you can do is create a s specific barrier for him uh, that will kind of light, that will permit him but no one else. Oh, um, wow. Mm hmm. Yeah, those are specific wards. Um, the easiest thing to do is, is obviously to have something of theirs, and you do. Like, uh, uh, usually I've, I'm a big fan of sigils because they're very direct and they're simple, and you can hide them real, real easy. Um, but what you could do, this is just off the top of my head, uh, take some coarse salt, like kosher salt, uh, if you don't mind taking some of your dad out. <laughs> yeah. You can you can combine it with the salt and like line. I mean, I don't know how many times that you open your windows, but you can either you can also put it in like a little bag and put it over each portal of entry, like the doors, a window, back door, closet doors, anywhere that could be considered a liminal space, which is any in between spot, mm -hmm. because that's how things get in. Then that if you while you're like I would say put it in a mortar and pestle and as you're grinding it. Speak your intent, feel your intent, said, it's like, you know, only dad is allowed in, say his name, you know, if you want to put, you know, take his name, put it into the mixture so it knows exactly what it is. You can put your own blood in there because you share your own blood. Though blood magic is a little bit tricky, I'm just saying that's one of the ways to strengthen it. But the salt is to keep the bad stuff out and the ashes of which is a, uh, for your father to get in. This is just off of my head from the things I've done because mm -hmm. I've, I've made people specific wards before. Uh, but if you don't feel comfortable learning just me, just ask other people. I'm sure you know other people who are magical or knowledgeable, but that is one thing you could do. But the best thing to keep things out is always put above doorways or in windowsills. Like I salt my doors and windows because things do come in. Mm -hmm. So I even keep a bowl of salt in my living room to keep things to suck up negativity. Nice. Uh, but that is what you can create a war specific. Now, this is, this is an example. There are other things you can do. Like if you have like a t-shirt or something uh, or any kind of an object, like you can create spirit specific wards that keep the negative out and only let the person in. It's also possible when you've told your dad that you can't come here anymore, you told the other things they can't come in. So who knows? Yeah, because pretty much everything stopped after that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I to do. It's like, you're not allowed in here. You need to go. That's like the, all you really have to do, is, especially with uh, entities like um, non-human spirits. That's, that's It's like when you have a demon's name. You guys talked about this. I, I listened to that one about uh, uh, Solomon. Pazuzu. Oh, and Pazuzu. Solomon. Yeah. Yeah. But when you have a demon's name, you do have control over it. When you have anything's name, you have control over it. Mm -hmm. So you could even say your father's full name is allowed in here. And that should be enough. But, you know, I'm sure you you can figure it out if you still want your dad to come around, you know, to see your kids. It's probably the only reason he was there. He wanted to make sure his, his grandbabies are OK. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something you could you can invite him as long as it's only him. Yeah. Well, Karen, we don't want to take up any more of your time, but I mean, I could talk to you for hours. This is fantastic. <laughs> No, I don't have anything to do, and I don't really get to talk to anyone about this kind of stuff, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, besides my sister and a couple of friends, but I don't really see them very often. We, would, we definitely would love to have you back on, and we've, over the years, acquired our resident shaman and, and, and other <laughs> things, and we'd love for you to be our resident witch expert. <laughs> uh, I don't know about expert. I'm, I, I'm, uh, I know enough from a lot of dabbling, and I'll say I can talk to you guys about the dead and dying until the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but <laughs> I'm also really good with, with fairies, fairy lore. I, I guess my full uh, experience is like my resume would include fairies, death, spirits, uh, some angelic, some demonic, some theology. Um, I, I'm just a, I'm just your basic witch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a basic witch. Love my pumpkin spice. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> It's disgusting. Where can everybody reach you if they like to get a hold of you? Uh, on Twitter um, is probably the easiest. Uh, at her witchy arts, that's one word. Uh, and it's the same thing as uh, Instagram. If you want to look at my art or pictures of my cat, because it's mostly just my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves cats. Um, yeah, that's really about it. Uh, I'm I'm really easy to get a hold of because I don't do anything. 
<laughs> Same here. <laughs> no, you guys have lives and jobs. I don't have any of that. Uh, half of us do. Oh, who's who are you calling a deadbeat? <laughs> Me. I, I'm the deadbeat. He's, I'm... he's got the life. I've got the job. Yeah, yeah. Oh. We'll split it. Okay. Well, balance is good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll see about getting my friend Mike in here. and Maybe he can talk about his psychometry and what he's been doing. That would be fantastic. That's, that's a story. And maybe yeah, my friend Noelle, really she's cool. also a witch. She's really good. <laughs> I could pull out a lot of people for you. <laughs> <laughs> All are welcome. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you again for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Um, hope I didn't ramble too much and you've got 45 minutes of material. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, more than that. I, I, there's no editing needed on this one. This is fantastic. Absolutely fascinating. Great. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much again, and you have a good evening. You too, guys. See you on Twitter. <laughs> Absolutely. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.